Second, many of the proclamations justify the claim made for the person of Jesus on the basis of the event that God raised Jesus from the dead, an event for which testimony is provided. And the close relationship between the claims for the person of Jesus and the evidential basis of the resurrection is seen in the Athenians' misunderstanding of the message proclaimed by Paul. Luke writes this, Also some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him, that's Paul, some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seemed to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They thought that Paul was proclaiming a God, Jesus, Jesus, and his consort, Anastasis, resurrection. Of course they were wrong and Paul made sure that he put them right. But what is missing in these speeches when we compare this with our modern proclamations? First, there is no mention of heaven or hell as our human destiny when we die. Although judgment features in some of the accounts, the explicit mention of places of reward or punishment is lacking. Hades or hell is mentioned as the place of the dead in quotations from the Old Testament. And heaven is either the sky or the place of God's present existence. Secondly, and on this I want to talk more fully, there is no mention of the love of God for humanity in any speech. In fact, the word love in any of its forms is not used in the proclamation. Furthermore, the word love is not used at all in the Acts of the Apostles. Compare this with the frequency with which our presentations include the love of God. The first of the four spiritual laws states, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. For many today, God's love for humanity is an indispensable part of the proclamation. When we turn to the Synoptic Gospels, we observe that even though Matthew and Luke include significant sections on the teaching of Jesus, there is no explicit mention of God's love for humanity. An observation that is a surprise to most people I quote that out to. In fact, as I put up there, the phrase the love of God occurs only in the context of our love for God, not God's love for us. So we need to turn away from the synoptic, the first three Gospels, to look at John's Gospel. And we find there God's love for humanity is mentioned, and it occurs only in one place, John 3.16, which we know so well. And even this verse differs from our popular presentations. Our English language translations of this verse use the past tense, God so loved the world as they do also have similar statements in the Jovenine letters. While in modern presentations of the Gospel, the present tense, God loves you, is used almost exclusively. And indeed such a difference in tense indicates a difference in meaning. In the biblical tense, the past, or more collect correctly in these situations, the aorist tense, is used because the love of God for humanity is connected and understood through an event, the giving of his only son. The knowledge of this event precedes the knowing of the love of God. As John writes in his first letter, God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Our use of the present tense in our proclamation detaches the knowledge of God's love from that particular event. Thus, the knowledge of God's love for humanity is not derived from the event of the giving of His only Son. Rather, our presentations make God's love into a general concept through which God's actions may be critiqued. In the biblical text, 
God's love is part of the explanation for God's action, but for us, God's love has become part of the proclamation. In the year 2000, Don Carson, who's uh, a research professor of New Testament at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in the state, published a small book entitled The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God. In the first chapter, he gives five reasons why the doctrine of the love of God must be judged difficult. They are, if people believe in a God at all today, the overwhelming majority hold that this God is a loving being. Secondly, we live in a culture in which many and other complementary truths about God are widely disbelieved. Thirdly, more and more people believe that the only heresy left is the view that there is such a thing as heresy, and this makes the articulation of a biblical doctrine of the love of God an extraordinarily difficult challenge. Fourthly, in the cultural rush towards a sentimentalized, sometimes even a non-theistic vision of the love of God, we Christians have sometimes been swept along to the extent that we have forgotten that within Christian confessionalism, the doctrine of the love of God poses its difficulties. And finally, and this is what he focuses most of his work on, is that if we simplify this doctrine by overlooking some of we simplify this doctrine by overlooking some of the distinctions the Bible itself introduces when it depicts the love of God. Is the love of God unconditional? Well, the answer is yes and no. There are times in which it is conditional. An aspect of God's love may be unconditional, and another aspect of it may well be presented in the biblical text as conditional. So I want to make a few, um, apply some of these things, well just a couple of them actually, to our proclamation of the gospel. First, it would appear that God's love as a concept is not news. It is widely accepted for those who believe in a God. And I quote from an interview with unbelievers reported in Changing Evangelism. I doubt the existence of a judgmental God who requires blood to pacify his wrath, said a frowning Hartmut, a graduate student from Germany. Someone had to die before the Christian God could pardon us. But why can't he just forgive? And then there's all those places in the Old Testament where God commands that people be slaughtered. All that is troubling, I agree, responded Josie, who worked in an art gallery in Soho, but I have even more of a problem with the doctrine of hell. The only God that is believable to me is a God of love. The Bible's God is no more than a primitive deity who must be appeased with pain and suffering. Now those are intelligent people responding to the content of what has been presented. So we see in this interview the rejection of what Carson has called other complementary truths about God, such as God as judge. In fact, we see a rejection in the very way in which we believe God has shown his love to humanity, namely in the giving of his Son. And these difficulties arise out of our proclamation of the love of God. Why? Well, beginning with our, pro our proclamation with the love of God means that for our hearers, love becomes the interpretive concept from which an understanding of God is to be derived. We offer love as an interpretive concept, and non-believers already have a strongly held understanding of what love means for them. My 22-year-old um, assistant at St. Margaret's was preaching on the love of God, so she trawled the internet just to find out what she could find, what people believe the love, love to be, and she found these definitions of love, to have a great affectional liking for, a deep feeling of sexual desire and attraction, 
any of a number of emotions related to a sense of strong affection, a deep and tender feeling of affection for attachment or devotion to a person or persons, a strong liking for or interest in something. Well, if those are the definitions which people work with, and that's what they hear when they talk about love, we can see that they are unwilling to adapt their understanding of love to incorporate our understanding of God. They would prefer us to change our concept of God to incorporate their understanding of love. And the temptation for us is to do just that. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote in this book, Discipleship, Cheap grace is the deadly enemy of our church. We're fighting today for costly grace. And he goes on to say cheap grace means grace as a doctrine, a principle, a system. It means forgiveness of sins proclaimed as a general truth. The love of God taught as the Christian conception of God. And we can dismiss the objections of non-believers too easily. Some objections they have relate to real issues and difficulties which the doctrine of love poses even within the Christian church, as Carson has stated. Other difficulties arise over the conflicting views of the nature of love as found in the Bible and those views widely held in our society. And it's interesting to note that in the Greek Bible, and by that I include both the Septuagint and the New Testament, the most common word for love, agape, is a most uncommon word in Greek culture. According to Kittel, it is almost completely lacking in pre-biblical Greek. And in the Greek Bible, therefore, the meaning of the word agape is filled in by the context in which it occurs. But our word love comes with a strong preconceived understanding. And where does this lead our proclamation? I think we need to demonstrate clearly in our proclamation that the person of Jesus of Nazareth is the means whereby we know God. It is not love, but Jesus. Indeed, this is not denying the love of God at all for us but are saying that, in fact, using it as a proclamation creates difficulties in what people hear us say. And surely we are trying to communicate something to them, not to confuse them. We are trying to communicate that in the person of Jesus. We know God, not in the concept of love. No one has ever seen God. It is God the only Son who is close to the Father's heart who has made him known. Jesus says, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. The writer of the letter to the Hebrews explains, long ago God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the reflection of God's glory, and the exact imprint of God's very being. The writer of the letter, of the second letter to Timothy, says these words, Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David, that is my gospel. Paul begins his letter to the Romans. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. So we're not here to introduce people to a doctrine or a concept, even one as important and as difficult as the love of God. We're here to introduce people to a person, Jesus of Nazareth, whom we took and crucified, 
but whom God raised from the dead. And it is our responsibility to show why it is in the different evangelistic context which we, in which we find ourselves that this Jesus is good news. And how it is that the resurrection justifies our assertions made for him. What we say may not be accepted, may not be popular, but at the least it provides a connection between those who hear and the one who is able to save them. So I have some questions. The first one, and you'll see these on the sheet of paper, but we'll come back to these. If you had a voluntary moratorium on the use of the word love in your presentations of the gospel, how would this affect its content? Can you do it? And secondly, Paul in Acts 17 addresses the general culture of the Athenians in his speech in front of the Areopagus. How do we do that in our context? How do we relate the good news to the culture of secular New Zealanders? That is our task. Thank you.